Okay, I get it. I'm very discerning. <laughs> so um, it's really important that we understand the times and seasons that we're in, and we're going to talk about that today. That, um, you know, a few, I guess it was back in April, we did the first uh, celebration that the Lord asked us to do forever. He said, there's three feasts I want you to celebrate. It was Passover, which the Christian church calls Easter, Resurrection Sunday, but it's totally connected with Passover. And then 50 days later was what? Pentecost, and that was the giving of the law back in the Old Testament, but now we know it's the second chapter of Acts, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And anybody know what the next one is coming, the third one? Tabernacles. Okay, that's coming up in October this year. It's usually September. It's in the fall every year, but just because of the difference in the Jewish calendar and our calendar, it's, uh, it's going to come in October this year. And, and we're in this season where we're going from Pentecost, which, again, is our infilling of our Holy Spirit, and, and to the time of tabernacles, which we'll think about and study as the summer goes by, but we're only going to talk about it a little bit today as that third dimension, because coming out of Egypt is pretty clear what God was doing, right? He took them out of slavery to the Egyptians, and when we were enslaved, enslaved to sin, we were not in control of our lives, amen? We, we were following the devil. But God brought you through the Red Sea, didn't he? Amen. How many of you here are saved? So right there, you got delivered from the Egyptian slavery of the devil, and you're no longer a slave to that sin anymore, and that should make you very happy. Amen. And that's why we like to worship, <laughs> and why we like to celebrate, and why we like to dance. It's just good to remind yourself that even when the circumstances may cause you to feel like, oh, man, I'm a little discouraged today, that you remind yourself, no, I serve a God who's alive and well. He's resurrected. That same spirit's inside me. And regardless of this temporary affliction that I might be going through, I might need an answer, but he's going to give me the answer because he's a good father and he knows, how to, he knows how to give me the right answers. And then he filled me with the spirit. And that's such a powerful gift that we have. And remember John the Baptist, Jesus said, that he was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, but even the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Why is that? Holy Spirit. Because you got filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, that's pretty good, isn't it? doesn't matter. You don't have to qualify. You don't have to submit a resume and apply for the job. When you become a Christian, you get filled with his spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you and empowers you. So, of course, the enemy would try to shut that down, try to bring shame, try to get you to focus on what you're not. But the Bible says what we are, priests and kings. And that's part of what this tabernacle season is about. Because it's one thing when you're in slavery to the Egyptians and you've got to listen to Pharaoh. And then they're 40 years in the desert and they don't know what to do. God gives them the law so that they have a blueprint on how to follow. But he gave us a better thing. He gave us Holy Spirit. So we don't have to go to stone tablets anymore. It says that he's written on, the, on our hearts, right? So he, we have a covenant relationship with him where he's living inside of us, and our body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. But the third dimension is what happens with tabernacles is they get the land. And that, with that blessing comes responsibility. You've got to rule. What's the thing about being a king? You can't pass the buck. The buck stops here. That was on the desk of one of our presidents. He had a plaque on his desk. The buck stops here. Because people are tempted to pass the buck. Right. <laughs> it's not my job. Give it to Tricia. <laughs> no, no. The buck stops with you when you're the king. Right. And, you know, the dad role, we just celebrated Father's Day two weeks ago, right? That's, that's a good biblical role of somebody with, that has to say the buck stops here. Who's paying the bills? Who's doing the budget? Who's in charge? And, and it's, a, it's a partnership, husband and wife, right? We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, but somebody has to be in charge. But if you've been in slavery for 400 years, and then you wandered in the desert for another 40, and you get your land, it's not so easy to know how to rule. And when the devil comes and tries to intimidate you, you don't have that treasure chest full of what your father did what your mother did, because you don't know what it was like to rule, and God teaches us that you are kings, but you'll be a much more effective king if you're lined up as a priest. <laughs> we were in a, a men's Bible study, and we were asking each other, 
what is the thing that would make your wife feel most secure? Because that's the highest priority for a woman, is to feel safe. And the highest priority for a man, this is all biblical, is to feel respected. So how would a woman feel respected, at least in my house, is she needs to know that I'm in the word, that I'm praying, that I have my priorities properly aligned, and that God comes first, even before her. Amen. Say amen, Trish. Amen. She said it. I know you think you heard it, but she said it. <laughs> so for, real, for a marriage to really succeed in the Lord, your spouse needs to love the Lord more than they love you. Yeah. That's actually the best thing that could happen to you, yeah. is that you marry somebody who's that deep in love with God. But if I go a week or two, and she's sensing, boy, he doesn't seem like he's been in the Word lately. He's been a little agitated. He's been a little carnal. He's been a little sarcastic recently. I mean, sarcasm is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. There's no translation in the Bible that says sarcasm is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's a sign of bitterness that's starting to pop up on the inside of you. It's funny. <laughs> okay, I got a no in the front. <laughs> I mean, deep down, it, it isn't, because you're usually making fun of something of somebody. It's funny in the moment, because it's usually true, the thing that's being exploited, there's some truth behind it, but you're not treating them the way you'd want to be treated, because we got enough people pointing out our flaws in the world, don't we? But we need some life-giving priests who understand the role of a king, which is to speak life, not death. So look, you know, she's not going to feel safe if she doesn't think I'm praying and reading my Bible and spending time with the Lord, because the first question Trisha will always ask me is, what did the Lord say? Amen. That's a blessing, Amen. but it's a lot of work, <laughs> right? You can't just assume that this is the right way to handle a situation. And, you know, thank God for godly wives Amen. and godly husbands that aren't going to just operate in the natural. We work off a different kingdom and men, I don't know if I should make such a broad general statement, but in general, the jokes are that we don't even like to stop and ask for directions because that's like some kind of sign of weakness that we have to ask for help. And prayer can be interpreted, interpreted as weakness because you shouldn't have to ask. That's a lie. Let's just sever that lie right now. God wants us in dialogue, talking to him all the time. And man, I just... I was so blown away by the Passion Translation again, right here in Revelation 1, 5, and 6. I'm going to read it. It's the text again. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruling king. Okay, so we know he's the king of kings. It's right here. <laughs> it's right in the name. You can't miss it. He's the king of kings. And it should be your king for sure, but he's the kings of the, kings of the earth. Now to the one who constantly loves us and has loosed us from our sins by his blood and to the one who has made us to rule, come on, as a kingly priest. There it is. It's a kingly priesthood. You and I are part of a kingly priesthood. And I'll repeat a couple of times just because I want the picture to be there for you. They weren't used to that in the Old Testament. They were used to a king. And then they were used to the priests. And they were following the orders of the Lord on the priests, but God wasn't too thrilled about the king part, right? Remember King Saul? The people were getting jealous of the other nations, and they said, we want a king like the other nations. How did that work out? <laughs> Not too good. But then King David brought a redemptive quality to the, the king and the priest's role, and then Jesus had to be from the line of David. So there's clearly something there, right? And then we also hear this name Melchizedek in the New Testament, and he's a combination of a king and a priest. So there's these pictures of what we're supposed to be but at the end of the day, when we wake up in the morning, we should feel like we're on a mission. Yeah. How many feel that way? I, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Because if you don't, that's okay. We're going to pray that you do. Lord, anybody in here who doesn't feel they're on a mission for you, wake them up to that mission. Wake them up. Light a fire on the inside of them so that when they wake up in the morning, they're excited and they say, oh, what's the adventure today, Lord? What's the great adventure that we're going to be on today? You have made me a king and a priest. And I'm going to fulfill both of those roles. The, the, the buck stops here part means I'm going to have to make some tough decisions. I'm going to have to confront some things that don't feel comfortable in the time that I'm confronting them. You all know that feeling, right? Now, not everybody is afraid of confrontation, but most of us would be a little reluctant to engage. And we can read the Bible in kind of a, a sissified way if we're not careful. 
because it's not just be weak and turn the other cheek every time you get confronted about something. That, that verse is misunderstood. He was the lion and the lamb. He was a worshiper, but he was a warrior, the greatest warrior. There's nothing sissified about a warrior going to the cross on your behalf. And he wasn't some skinny string bean looking guy. He was a carpenter. They didn't have power tools. He was carrying all that stuff around, man. He looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm telling you, he was built. And they weren't just using wood. There was not as much wood as there was stones. If you were a carpenter, you were building with stone. So this idea that he was some skinny little weakling, that's a problem. Oh, no. He was a man's man. But he was strong enough that he didn't have to fight flesh with flesh. <laughs> that's a godly king. You have the authority but you choose not to use it unless you have to. But knowing that you have to use it sometimes is really important, isn't it? That's part of the king. Sometimes we have to go to war. It's the way it works. 